Well, good morning, church. What a beautiful day to be alive and breathing. Amen. Would you stand with us as we pray and begin our service this morning? Lord Jesus, we come before you today, and we are just so grateful for the breath in our lungs from the breath giver, from the life giver, from life himself. Father, would you be glorified today, God, as we bring you our praise, as we bring you our worship. I just pray that you are glorified and honored through the uh, words that we sing, through what is preached, and through um, just our heart attitude towards you. God, we give you the praise and the glory today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to beat Pastor Sean to it and say, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Only a week away. Can you believe it? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. the joy. You are the joy giver, the joy bringer, and we are so thankful for that. God, we just continue to um, rejoice in anticipation of your son being born and what that means for us. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, good morning, Trinity Alliance Church. Good to see everybody this morning. Love the sparkly faith. God, love it. Love the sparkly joy. <laughs> Take a look at Joy's shoes when, when you have a chance. So, a um, couple of announcements this morning. Uh, we have, uh, of course, our Christmas Eve service coming up, and uh, like Grace, I can't believe it's already a week away. So, hopefully, your shopping is at least started. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, we are going to be meeting here. Uh, we're still going to have two services, but it's a little different. So 10 a.m. on Christmas Eve on, on Sunday morning is our first service, and then 5 p.m. is a Christmas Eve service. Now, both services are going to be the same. So if you come in the morning, you can still come for Christmas Eve service. You just get part two of, of the service. So uh, so there's there's no, uh, no difference between the two. So just uh, be aware of that next week. Uh, there is uh, Sacred Spaces that's going to be meeting tomorrow night, uh, 6 p.m. And what's that? Tonight, tonight I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my thing says tomorrow night. It was sent on Saturday. <laughs> tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, then there is also a special New Year's Eve uh, Sacred Spaces. They're going to be starting here at 8 p.m. and going through, uh, through 1 a.m. So that's going to be New Year's Eve on the 31st. Uh, 
Finally, uh, third announcement, uh, there is caroling tonight. So for those of you that like to Christmas carol, uh, meet here at the church at 4 p.m. Uh, and, and then they're gonna go out from there. So uh, tonight, not tomorrow, tonight at 4 p.m. caroling. Uh, finally, uh, last announcement, uh, we are going to be participating in the 40 days of prayer coming up here at the new year. And so you'll see in the table in the back uh, in the fellowship hall, we've got the booklets that are available for you uh, if you want them. Uh, there also will be a link to, uh, to PDF version, electronic version. Uh, that's gonna be published uh, probably the week after Christmas. And so be looking for that. And then uh, to fi finish up today, uh, Sean's gonna be doing a couple of uh, videos for us. So go and do that. As he's getting that ready, I do wanna say thank you uh, to our youth. These, these ladies and Micah have been coming for, uh, for about three months, I think it is, every Wednesday night coming early to youth group and practicing and, uh, and, and learning how to play as a, as a worship team. So thank you guys for, uh, for doing that. <laughs> For the fourth year in a row, our Alliance family is coming together for 40 days of prayer, launching the new year with this focused effort to pour out hearts to God with one voice, one heart as the Alliance family. If you register, we'll send you daily devotionals, either on a daily or weekly basis. You'll get to participate in a weekly online prayer gathering hosted by Alliance churches and culminating with a prayer and praise event hosted by Pathway Church in Redding, California after the 40 days come to a close. Alliance family, we want to launch the new year in this posture of dependence upon God. It's under the theme of now, this sense of urgency that we have, that now is the time for us to express our dependence upon God. Now is the time for us to come together in a united voice, calling upon our God to strengthen his church, to minister to families, to pour out his blessing, to reach the unsaved in his name. So Alliance family, let's take advantage of this united effort to gather together for 40 days of prayer. Hopeless. That's how the Christmas season feels for many around the world. In the hard places the Alliance serves, there are people who do not know the name of Jesus. No songs are sung in hope of his birth. No Advent candles lit in anticipation of our coming King. It's a season like any other, and it's empty. But emptiness begs for hope. And hope is here. The Creator entered His creation to bring salvation. In Scripture, this moment is declared with a host of angels, with the glory of the Lord shining all around them, tearing the darkness apart. Through Jesus, hope came into the world, and the world would never be the same again. So while that which surrounds us may be void of the Christmas spirit, there's no emptiness in our hearts. The invitation for us is simple. Extend hope to those dwelling in darkness. When you give to the Alliance Christmas Offering, you keep international workers, leaders, and our churches present in those hard places, extending the hope of the Christ child among the world's marginalized, displaced, and unreached peoples. This Christmas, Join me in giving to the Alliance Christmas Offering, where, as the body of Christ, we have the opportunity, the blessing, to extend hope. Would you guys stand with us as we receive the word of the Lord? And it's not going to be up on the screen. Um, it will just be read. It comes from Luke 2. 8 through 14. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. 
and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel is joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory, Glory to, to God, God in the highest, highest heaven, heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Angels, we
Did you? 
Let's sing that together one more time. just so grateful this morning uh, to be with your people to worship you to remember that you are the great God of heaven you created everything and yet you were willing to give everything up to come down and live with us start as a baby and you live perfectly and father when we come to know you and we mess up we think sometimes that you're frowning at us. Remind us that you don't. You smile. You're, you're the father. You're the mother that when we're learning to ride our bikes and we fall over and get skinned up, you patch us up and put us on the bike and say, try again. Father, we, we can be so hard on other people and ourselves. We're so grateful that you're not like that that you're the greatest cheerleader we could ever have. And so this morning, we just, uh, we just want to say thank you for loving us so well and being such a good, uh, both mother and father to us. May we in this season, um, in a deeper way, uh, Father, our prayer is that we would come to appreciate all that you gave up and yet living perfectly you know we're not going to, and you're still for us. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know why, but I just had this vision <clears throat> of having all those teenagers up here while I'm preaching sometime and, like, you know, kind of do a gospel -y kind of message, right? Where they kind of like every once in a while sing the song or sing the verse that I just, you know, whatever. I mean, I don't know. It's my brain, sorry. <laughs> Emphasizing certain points. <laughs> sorry, I'm just going down this track. It's fitting for this message, I guess. Dreaming, right? It's good. Merry Christmas. Guys, doing? You ready? You excited? It's a good time. Plans to uh, visit family or visit family to visit you. Hang out with those uh, that you love in your family, and and then uh, you know endure the ones that uh, you you know. There's a reason you don't live so close to them. <laughs> uh, it's reality. It's true, right? It's good. Um, it's good. I love you, church. I love uh, being here. I love being a part of your lives and you choosing to be a part of mine. God is good and, uh, and he is, uh, he's, he's, it's the body of Christ, right? This is family, right? It's, uh, uh, I'm amazed uh, the, the sweet uh, connections that come in the midst of a body of believers like this. Uh, when you, you, know, you, you kind of engage over and over again through the years and and Christmas is becoming something that, you know, I'm, I, I, you guys have taught me how to worship, how you guys do Christmas together. And it's been really sweet, right? And it's one of those things that now is tradition, right? Um, and uh, I understand, you know, in some sense, Jesus' words, you know, about who is my brother, who is my mother, who is my father, who is my sister, right? Who is it? It's, it's those who are in the body of Christ, those who are here among us, right? And, and so, anyway, so I just appreciate you, church, for... Um, being a part of my family, thanks for letting me be a part of yours. 
We've been talking about embracing winter, and, and I have to admit, uh, you know, at the Lord, uh, I think we kind of laughed about this a couple of weeks ago, but, you know, the Lord this year, the holidays have been interesting, the things that he's led me to, to preach, and um, we preached uh, out of Acts chapter 5, our Mother's Day, about Ananias and Sapphira, a uh, great Mother's Day message, and then... Uh, <laughs> Father's Day's message was uh, we were in Acts chapter uh, I think it was seven right uh, Stephen's uh, martyring you know and and uh, and then for Christmas this year for Advent he gives me this uh, embracing winter kind of series in the last two weeks especially yeah I don't know and I've been very kind of joyful <laughs> you know there's been this tension you know in it of first of all letting things die right and to to be thinking about death at a time where you know typically we're kind of all zeroed in on you know uh, the celebrations and the fun and, and this kind of thing and and so and then last week uh, zeroing in on purity right and and allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and examine us uh, recognizing that Jesus is calling us into purity, that, that he wants us to worship him and him alone. Matter of fact, if we try to add anything to it, we stop worshiping him right away. It's just that thing, whatever it is. And, and so both of those messages were hard, right? There, there's, this, there's this tension in it, like, wait a second, it's Christmas. We're supposed to be like having fun, you know, and it's supposed to be, you know, joyful messages and this kind of thing. And, and so, I, you know, this, this is kind of where we're at and the Lord, reality of what the Lord has led us to. And, but my hope is, I think this morning that uh, this message might be a little bit more uh, joyful in it and a little bit more encouraging. Um, it's a message that I think is going to be still stretching for us, right? Right? It's a message that I feel like in some sense the Lord's been, um, uh, he's been teaching me this throughout this year. I, um, uh, about uh, two or three weeks ago, I, I, um, I, I grabbed, you know, as I was writing my journal, in my journal, I kind of finished writing and then I went back to the beginning of the year and began to read through my entries from earlier in the year and, and kind of read up through about halfway through the year through June or whatever. And I was amazed how right away in January, uh, a, a particular topic that the Lord began to really drive into me that is centered on this message today, uh, it started in January. Like in my mind, like it all came to a culmination like this summer and in this fall but I had forgotten that the first fruits of this if you will the first kind of uh, across the line you know my thoughts came in January and I had actually journaled about it a bit and and uh, anyway so this is a, a in some sense a message that I feel like the Lord has been developing in me and it's it's been hard to learn, and I've been surprised by how difficult it is. A, 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 a message about dreaming, but as we'll get into it, it's a message about dependence on Jesus. A, a, a message about asking Jesus to bless us, <laughs> to, to, to provide for us, to, to do something for us. And, and so uh, the message this morning, again, in regards to winter, like... Uh, we've seen that winter, we have to allow the old crops to die. We need to allow the old uh, provisions that you, you know, used to provide for us. We've got to let those things go, right? And the old things that you, we used to rely on, we've got we to let them go. And, then, and, and, and that's part of being in winter. But then also the death of those things opens up our perspective and our view. And with those things gone, we can then begin to see the... the, the the impurities in our lives. We can see the impurities in the soil that we need to pull out and get that debris out so that we can make room again for new life. But also another thing that we do in winter is we begin to dream. As a pastor friend of mine shared with, uh, shared with me on, on Friday as I was sharing a little bit of this message, he said, yeah, winter, right? It's, we, it's darker, right? We spend, it's, it's, a, it's a season where we often sleep more in the winter, right? There's kind of more opportunities for rest maybe and, and whatnot. And because we're sleeping more, there's this reality that we dream more, right? And, uh, and so we see in winter, this, uh, it's a time for us to dream, to imagine next year's harvest, <laughs> to begin to kind of think about uh, what we're going to expect, what, what's coming next, right? It, it's with the, the death of the old uh, pro, of sources of provision that we can begin to dream about what maybe is coming, uh, what God's going to do next in our life. 
It's uh, winter is a time when we, we, uh, we determine how much seed we're going to purchase and where we're going to plant that seed. Human beings, I think, are natural dreamers. We certainly all have dreams at night. You know, uh, I, I, I've said before, I, I don't remember my dreams. Uh, some of us remember them quite vividly. Uh, but it was in a dream, one dream that I remember, but it was in a dream this, that I remember that I found out my sister is actually a robot. <laughs> it's really helpful to know as a kid growing up. Um, it really helped me to understand how to interact with her. It's also, though, uh, in, in, a, in my wife's dream that I found out what a scoundrel I am uh, as well. <laughs> Uh, so that, that, that's good. So, so, you know, we dream, right? We have all of these crazy dreams and, and our dreams at night are, you know, they, they often tap into our fears and our anxieties. Uh, you know, how many of us have had the naked dream, right? You know, you're like there, like, oh my gosh, like there's all these people around and I'm naked, right? Yes, it's the, the you're freaking out because of anxiety, right? Okay, I've had that dream too many times. Um, and you're like, I'm hiding behind something somewhere trying to like, there's people coming. Why do I don't have any, where's my clothes? What happened? Um, anyway, so that's an embarrassing dream, but we have it. Uh, <laughs> tapping into our fears and anxieties, but also into our, maybe our hopes and dreams. How many have had the, the flying dream? Right? So that's, that's not, you know, you're like, you know, you're flying like, that's kind of like this excitement, right? Like, yes, look, I've never had that dream. So I haven't, I, I'm, I'm not excited about it. Anyway, I have no hopes and dreams. Anyway, but uh, so dreams uh, that happen at night, you know, they, they do tap into some of what's going on in our life and what is going on in our hearts. But, but really when we, we think about the daydreams that we have, right? When we think about what we dream about when we are awake, those dreams tell us a lot about what's in our hearts as well. They tell us about what we imagine and what we hope for in the future. They tell us what we believe is possible and what is not. They tell us what is important to us, the things that we're really focused on. Some of our dreams, uh, our daydreams, are, are false hope dreams. You know, the, the triumphalistic kind of dream, like, you know, this utopian, you know, kind of city or, or experience that we're going to have. Like, you know, someday down the road, then everything is just going to come in to, to, you know, to, together, and it's going to be amazing, and my life is going to be awesome, and there's not going to be anything wrong, and it's going to be, oh, just so amazing, right? So with this utopian mindset, right? Or, or, of course, these false hope dreams are also certainly narcissistic, <laughs> where we become the hero of every one of our dreams. We imagine what we're going to do and how we're going to step in and make this work and the, the, the message we're going to bring, we're going to preach that just everybody is going to just like come to Jesus moment, right? We also have the no hope dreams. Some of us have a season of pessimism, others of us, I think, live in a pessimistic mindset. And so the daydreams we have are of doom and gloom. Everything's gonna get worse. Everything's gonna fall apart. As bad as my life is right now, it's just there's more coming. That's more gonna be bad. Another no hope dream and less, a little less pessimistic and dark is the apathetic daydream. Are we just really don't dream about anything. We just don't think about what's next. We're just like, you know, I'm, I'm content with where I'm at. I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of happy. It's okay. I don't need anything else. I can survive. I'll be all right. But no matter what, whether we're having false hope dreams or no hope dreams, typically all of our dreams are temporal dreams. They're dreams that are focused on the physical realities around us. They're focused on physical transformation or blessing or physical pain and suffering. They're focused on maybe dreams of reconciliation in relationships, dreams of uh, a better day uh, health-wise or body begins to, to operate the way it should, better days of wealth. Someday when I get that job and I make just a little bit more money and then I'm you know, able to do this and that, I think if most of us sat down and began to talk about the things that we dream about, most of it, if not all of it, 
would be centered on things of this world, earth-bound dreams. And if that's the case, then we're dreaming too small. We're dreaming in black and white instead of color. We're, we're dreaming of mud pies <laughs> instead of peach pies. C.S. Lewis has a somewhat famous quote. He writes, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires, our dreams, to not be too strong, but too weak. We, have ha we are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to make, go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine <laughs> what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Our dreams are too small. We must learn to dream bigger dreams. We must begin to dream dreams that aren't dependent on us accomplishing them. We must dream dreams that demand Jesus to show up. And in order to dream dreams that are bigger, we must seek and know Jesus. Because here's the reality, just like any father, he has greater dreams than we do. He has greater dreams for us than we do. We so often, again, dreaming in, in, in a temporal sense, uh, dreaming about things that we can do or, or that are dependent on us making it happen. But Jesus has bigger dreams. Dreams that will bless us way more than those temporal dreams that we have. Dreams that are so much greater than the things that we can accomplish. Dreams that will require him to show up, but also will require us to join him in what he's doing. The fact of the matter is, God, I think, calls us to dream. Imagine or consider the dream that God called Abram to. Will you follow me? I want to make you a great nation. <laughs> I'm going to make you a great nation. It's so great. I'm going to give you land, and it's going to be like this massive space. Like, it's going to be amazing, but I'm going to bless the rest of the world through you. We, we don't know a lot about Abram before this moment when God speaks, but I can imagine Abram was not dreaming about being a great nation. Married to a woman who was barren. Can't be a great nation. I, I'm sure by the time that God comes and speaks this dream over him, he kind of had let that, like he was kind of like, yeah, I, that, I'm not gonna, that's not going to be my life. It's okay. I love my wife. We're, we're going we're gonna to hang out together. It's going to be great. God will bless you. I got some nephews I can hang out with a lot. He's a good guy, right? You know, but I don't think he was dreaming about being a great nation until God steps in and says, hey, I want you to dream about something different. Moses. I don't think Moses, you know, he had a moment when he was younger, you know, he's like, ah, oh, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to free my people. And then he kind of really messed that up. And then he goes and he flees, you know, and he's like out in the desert and he's like, he's happy. He's got his wife. He's got his kids. He's got his shepherding. You know, he's kind of doing his thing. This works, right? And he, he was happy. He was content. He wasn't dreaming. He had forgotten all about the call to go back and release, you know, the people of the Israelites, right? And yet God shows up in a burning bush and gives him a new dream. The Israelites themselves, 400 years in captivity, 400 years as slavery. He calls them out of the slavery into the desert, but shows them the promise. And what is he called? What is the promise? Flowing with milk and honey. 
Like, he is taking them from total deprav- total, uh, 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 you know, nothing to have, right? No food. I'm mean, struggling to exist, struggling to survive. And then he shows them this amazing land. Ask them to dream a different dream. Not just the dream of, oh, we don't want to be slaves anymore. But, but dreams of abundance. King David. I think Solomon is really interesting. Because in Solomon, it's almost like God doesn't like dream for him. It's like he recognizes that Solomon actually is a pretty good dreamer on his own. And so he shows him, he says, Solomon, ask for whatever you wish. Now, Solomon, of course, he asks for wisdom and God blesses him with everything else as well, right? It is amazing. But, but again, God is calling us to dream. Consider this, uh, this, this tension In the story of John chapter 1 of Nathanael, we have a a passage up front uh, on the screen. I think we can show, read this. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? (laughs) Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He he expanded Nathaniel's dreaming. Like Daniel comes, or Nathaniel shows up and he's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you saw me under the fig tree. And Jesus is like, no, no, that's just, that's just a small thing. Dream a little bit more. I, I've got bigger dreams for you. You're going to actually see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Consider Luke chapter 10, verses 17 to 20. The disciples are coming back from, uh, you know, <laughs> driving out demons and preaching the gospel message and healings and all of this. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Dream bigger. It's not just the things of the world that you see. There's so much more. The fact that your name is written in the book of heaven, that's that's a bigger thing. That's that's the joy and the hope of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Consider as well Matthew chapter 21, verses 20 to 22. When the disciples saw, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? Because Jesus is walking along, he goes over to get a fig, and it's like, there's none there. And he's like, ah, curse you, fig tree, and then it dies. And Jesus answers them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it'll happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Dreaming bigger. Dreaming God-sized dreams. Dreaming about what Jesus is dreaming about for us. For too many of us, dreaming is something that is so focused just in this world. And those dreams are not big enough. Winter is not about figuring out what we can reasonably expect and dreaming about that. It's about knowing the trends and the practical realities of our life and our world and then asking Jesus what his dream is. Winter dreaming is about dreaming Jesus' dreams with him. Once we've let the old things in our life die, purified our life of sin, and ensured we are single-mindedly focused on worshiping Jesus alone, we are ready to dream with Jesus. The dreams of Jesus are never earth-bound dreams that don't require his spirit to show up. 
His dreams are never something we can simply do on our own. Jesus' dreams for us are always a little on the crazy side, and they always require us to be totally dependent on him. Jesus' dreams will sometimes not make sense and will always require us to put our faith in him. Are you dreaming? And if you are, are you dreaming with Jesus? It's time for us to stop dreaming earthbound dreams and begin to dream kingdom-bound dreams. But there's more. We can't just stop with dreaming. Because dreaming is just about the imagination. We can dream a whole lot of things, and they just kind of are dreams. They just, they're just they not something that we really think that much about other than when we're dreaming. Like, hey, you know, a dream is just a dream of imagination. It's not about, you know, there's nothing that really happens with a dream. A dream is just kind of there. It's just part of, you know, again, our imagination and what we're considering could maybe someday be, the possi- be possible. But with God, with Jesus' dreams, with kingdom-bound dreams... We have to go beyond dreaming. We have to ask that those dreams would be fulfilled. You see, dreaming is just about imagination, but asking is about expectation. We can imagine a whole lot of things, but do we really expect God's going to do it? But when we take that dream and turn it into an ask... It conjures up in us a sense of expectation. We don't just dream in winter. We don't just dream about how much seed we're going to plant. We put in the order. We ask and we expect that Jesus is going to do something. And this is a reality, too, that Jesus invites us to ask. James 4, 2, this is, you know, an interesting uh, verse. You desire and do not have, so you murder, which seems extreme. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. That makes a little more sense. You do not have because you do not ask. Maybe we've dreamed Jesus' dreams but have we ever asked? So much of our life, we have, I, I think we've, we've missed out on so much of the blessings of Jesus because we just simply have never asked. The reality is, is that asking is evidence of our dependence on Jesus. Like if we think we can do the dream ourselves then we're not going to ask Jesus. Like, we'll just do it. And again, most of our temporal, earthbound dreams, you know, that's we, we dream and we just do it. And if it doesn't happen, oh, okay, we ask God to help us so that we can do it. But he's helping us, right? We're not helping him. And so there's no real dependence on Jesus. But when we take the dream and we dream the big dream and we hear Jesus say, hey, this is the dream that I'm dreaming. And we go, okay, I'm going to dream that with you. And we realize, oh my gosh, there's no way I can do that. And so we either, what are we going to do with that dream? We're we just going to let, well, okay, maybe someday you'll do that, God. But when we take the step, the next step and say, okay, God, you brought this dream to me. Will you do it? Will you make it happen? It shows our dependence on Jesus. Asking is also evidence of our surrender. I can't do it. I need help. I'm calling out to you like there's this big dream, and, and I would love to experience that big dream, but I can't do it on my own. I need you. 
A lot of times we will try and try and try and then finally get to a point where we're like, okay, I give up finally. I surrender. And, and this is the asking point, right? This is when we actually, okay, God, now Jesus, do it. you've got to do it. I can't. Asking is evidence of our faith and trust in Jesus. That we do really trust him. And this is, I think, a reality too. The things that we really care about, that we ask about, right? The, really, the things we really care about, something we don't want to ask God about. Because we don't know for sure what he's going to do with it. <laughs> but when we ask, it shows our faith and our trust in him that he's good. Asking is evidence that we're putting our hope in Jesus. And asking is evidence of expectation. If we ask, we expect that he's going to do something. If we ask, there's something that happens in our heart. It goes from just this dream, this ethereal thing in our minds, to all of a sudden something a little bit more concrete. And with expectation comes the, the, the vision to see. Like if we just have a dream but never ask Jesus about it, right? Never ask him to step in and make it happen. And we just have this dream out here. Well, we, we don't really, we don't notice what's going on, right? We don't notice if that dream is actually going to be fulfilled or if things are happening. But as soon as we ask Jesus, Jesus, will you make this happen? Then all of a sudden our eyes are open. We start to look for, okay, where is he doing? What's he doing? Is he making this happen? Where, how is he making it happen? What's that look like, you know? And, and what's my part in it? What's, what's he drawing me into? Just asking the question changes our perspective, changes our mind, and gets us in a mode of a readiness to do what God has, is calling us into. Jesus invites us to ask, but he also always responds. Now, this is where things start to get really sticky theologically. <laughs> There's a bit of a mystery here, and I don't want to act like I've got it all figured out because I don't feel like, feel like I do. But there's this reality that not only does he hear us when we ask, but that he does respond. He always responds. 1 John 5, 14 to 15 says this, and this is the confidence that we have Toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Now, the key, of course, is that if we ask anything according to his will. There's a tendency in our world, in some flavors of the church, to say that we can ask for anything, and if we ask for anything because we're God's child, like he's going to give it to us no matter what we ask for. So I can ask for a bowl of ice cream, and he could make it appear right now, right? And it's kind of this idea that whatever I ask for, that he is going to do it. And we have to be careful because God always responds, but he's going to always do his will, not ours. Now, we, the, the problem is that those of us on the other side who recognize this reality that, you know, I can't just ask for anything and God's going to do it uh, because it has to be in accordance with his will, we tend to like, well, I don't even really know if that's really God's will, and so I'm not going to ask at all. So there's, I think, a lesson for both of us that those of us who tend to like, you know, oh, well, it's got to be accordance to God's will, um, you know, it, so I'm not going to ask, like, n stop that. Jesus is calling you to ask. But in that ask, we have to surrender to his will and trust. Again, asking is faith and trust in him. Asking is saying, I believe that you can do this. I believe that you might do this. I believe this is, this is within maybe your will that I can see. But I believe that your will is so important that I want that above all else. Whether I get this thing or not, I want your will to be done. The Lord's Prayer. Jesus always responds, but he responds when we are in oneness with him. John 15, 7. 
If you abide in me, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Perhaps this is the issue that we have, those of us who are not just... um, Constantly asking God and expecting him to give us whatever we ask for in a moment. Perhaps this is the issue that we have, is that our, our vision is too small. Like, again, our dreaming is too small. We don't think that there's this, uh, this possibility that we can actually know his will. We don't think that maybe there's this possibility that, that the thoughts in my head actually might be from him. You know, I think sometimes we, we hold back and like, I don't know what his will is. And so it's too mysterious, it's too mysterious, it's too out there. And so I'm just not going to ask. Are you abiding with Jesus? Do you recognize that you can abide with Jesus? Do you recognize that you can be one with him? That you can experience that in fullness? When we are one, and understand, I, this, is, this is the point, like seek first his kingdom, right? If we find Jesus, if we are one with him, if we are abiding with Jesus, then the th- thoughts that we have, the dreams that we have are no longer our own. He begins to influence those dreams. He begins to influence those thoughts. And we begin to have a desire for his heart and not ours, to for his will to be done and not our will. So then we begin to pray things that actually are in alignment with Jesus. And then when we pray... It happens, not because it was our will, but because it was his will. We are thinking his thoughts after him. We're dreaming his dreams after him. Psalm 37, 4 and 5, we know this really well, right? Delight yourselves in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. We stop there. Delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. Again, this is kind of like, you know, whatever I want, whatever my desire is, I get from, if I delight myself, I love Jesus, he's amazing, and so now I get every, no, no, go on, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. Commit, you got, there's this oneness that has to happen, there's this abiding that has to happen. He wants us to live with an expectation that when we ask him, he will respond. But the only way we can actually experience that is if we actually know him, if we're abiding with him, if we are spending time with him, if we are one with him. And we have to ask with expectation. James 1, 5, and 6 If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Right? There has to be expectation in asking. There there should be expectation in asking. If we're going to ask him, we need to believe that he can do it. If we're going to ask him, we're going to believe that he's going to show up, that he's going to respond in some way. Now, he may not respond in the way we are expecting, but he's going to respond. We are asking for Jesus' will to be done. No matter what we're asking for, it is always asked under the perspective that Jesus' will would be done. James 4.3 So we read James 4, 2, now James 4, 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. And this is where dreams and asking come together. Our dreams are earthbound. Our dreams are focused on the things of this world. Our dreams are, 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 are having a healthy body for some of us. Our dreams are about having more money and wealth. Our dreams are about having a nicer house or having a family that's all reconciled together. Our, our, those are earthly dreams. They're earthbound dreams. We've got to dream bigger. We've got to dream higher. God's will will be done when we begin to see what his will is. And his will is so much bigger than just fixing us physically now. Here's the reality. Every time we pray for God to heal us of any kind of ailment. Do you realize like that prayer is already answered? Already answered whether or not you experience healing. What is the promise? What is God's will? When that day comes and we cross from this life to the next, what happens? Total restoration. Sometimes we look at the prayer for healing as being like this huge thing. Read Jesus, right? Read the Gospels. How many people did he heal? 
Like, I think Jesus, when we pray for healing, I think sometimes he's like, and again, it's not that he doesn't care, and it's just not that he doesn't heal. He does, right? Like, we've seen it. I've, we've got examples uh, just a couple of weeks ago, you know? We, this reality, right? God steps in, and he does do healing. But we have this perspective that, like, this is such a big deal if we ask God to heal. Like, if he shows up and brings healing. But for Jesus, like, this is nothing. He's, I, I think he's like, yeah, we've got that. Like, that, is, is that it? It, it, really, you just, you just want to feel better? Like, th- that's all you're dreaming about? Like, yeah, yeah, we got that. I, I, that's no problem. Like, I, I, I mean, I could do it now, but I could also do it. I mean, what, is, it, is that really all you're dreaming about? Now, understand, like, I, I get this reality that when you're, those who are sick, like, if really, especially really hard, like, it does consume your life. I get that. But I've also sat with people who have, been in those really sick places and I've seen him dream such bigger dreams Rebecca Moravec (laughs) she's with Jesus now and she wanted to be healed here before (laughs) that day came but she dreamed such bigger dreams in the midst of that sickness I think of Bobby Stewart. He's, a lot of you don't know Bobby Stewart. Man that was part of our church, pretty active for quite a while. First few years that I was here, and then epilepsy kind of came back. And he had this miracle happen for 20 years. Basically, epilepsy was taken away from him. He lived to be 50 when he should have been living, shouldn't have lived past 21. But in the midst of the suffering that he's in right now, and, and it, I, I'm not going to go into the details, but some of you know, like, it's amazing what it takes for him just to make through it each day. In the midst of that, I meet with Bobby, and I do not hear him complaining or asking God like he would heal. I mean, he wants God to heal him. But he's like, you know, he's dreaming bigger dreams. He's saying, God, what can you do in the midst of this? Like, what are you doing in the midst of this? Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What are the things that are added? It's the temporal stuff. If we'll dream Jesus' dreams, like the temporal things, he'll take care of it. He'll take care of those things. We don't have to ask about that. We don't have to, we don't have to dream about that. That's, that's too small. Let's, let's look bigger. Let's ask him for more. Let's ask him for the bigger things, the bigger things that he's doing. And, 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 and in order, again, to do that, we need to know what he's doing. Do you see what he's doing? Seek first his kingdom. There's this reality in Romans chapter 12, you know, that talks about how we can know his will. And how do we know his will? Through the transformation of our mind. I think, I think I put that, yeah. I appeal to you, brothers, therefore, by mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. So we live our life sacrifice for Jesus to worship him. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Don't we want to know the will of God? We know the will of God when we give it all up for him and we just seek first his kingdom. When we begin to pursue him and want to have oneness with Jesus, intimacy with him, to know him, to to, to know who he's created us to be. Because the will of God is not just simple, not something you kind of say, oh, this is the will of God or this is the will of God. No, the will of God is different for every one of us. And we're only going to know that will when we understand who he is and as he reveals not only himself to us, but as he reveals who he created us to be. He has so many more blessings for us. He has so many more great things for us to do. And we are wallowing in the mud, making mud pies. But what do we do when we pray, when we ask, and we don't receive? I've 
got five things I listed here I think that we can do in that time. First, we need to check our motives. Did we ask for my will to be done or for his? Make sure that that is in alignment. Second, we need to check for sin. You know, James 5, this great passage about, I don't have it up there, but uh, James 5 just came to me in this moment here, but James 5, this great passage about healing, right? The sick person coming and receiving prayer from the elders so that they can be healed. Well, in that passage, James ties confession of sin to healing. If you're not receiving something that you've asked for, I think uh, you need to check motives, but you also need to check your sin. Is there some sin that you need to repent of and deal with? A third thing you'd check would be hope. And I, and I think this is a dangerous, as sometimes it points to the motives. <laughs> but are, are you asking, is your hope, excuse me, is your hope in Jesus or is it in his response to what you're asking? Because sometimes we ask and we expect him, we've already got the exact answer how, how that's going to work. So we ask, but we're like, yeah, but you got to do it this way. I mean, I want ice cream, but I don't want chocolate ice cream. It's got to be vanilla, maybe some cookie stuff in there, some caramel on top, whipped cream would be, no nuts, by the way. No, <laughs> ee, it's just wrong. Anyway, uh, the third thing we need to check is faith. Are we trusting him? Or are we trying to do it on our own? Because we'll do that too. We'll ask him to step in and do something for us. And then we get busy doing it on our own. <laughs> and he's like, well, wait, wait a second. Okay. And then finally, I think this is, this is really key. We need to check our perspective. I think, I think Jesus answers our prayers, our, our, the things we ask. I think he answers it so often. But we don't see it. Because we're looking for it in the wrong place. Like, we got to check our perspective. If we are truly asking Jesus to step in and do something crazy that's beyond what we can do, then that means we need to look for how he's, how he's answering. What that's, what, you know, if it's beyond what we can do, then maybe the response or the, the end result is going to look different than what we currently are imagining. In regards to healing, like... Again, we tend to look just at the physical body. Like there is so much more healing that we need than just our physical bodies. How about our hearts? <laughs> not, not our physical hearts, but our spiritual hearts, our souls, right? How about our relationships? How about, you know, our emotions? How about our, you know, there's, there's, a multiple, there's multiple things that we need healing from. And I, you know, the Lord has, uh, has drawn me to, when I, if someone asks me to a pray for healing, I will oftentimes, like, I'm, I'm praying more holistically. Like, I see the physical need, yeah, but Lord, you know what? Maybe God's going to heal that. Well, he is going to heal that, no matter what. That's happening. But second of all, what do you want right now? Like, maybe it is physical healing right now, but maybe it's something else that's going on. And we have this tendency to make physical healing or healing just about the physical instead of so much more. So I think we have to, uh, you know, if, if, if we don't feel like God is answering our ask, if he's not responding, then we need to change maybe our perspective. Maybe we're not looking in the right place. Maybe our expectation is over here when he's actually answering it this way over here. Asking is also risky. This year, the Lord has been pushing, as I've said, this particular topic into my heart. And as he's stepped in and, and trying to get me to dream bigger and to ask for more, I've been shocked by how hard it is. How hard it is to ask, but also how hard it is to risk. You know, we as, I think, Americans sometimes, at least I know this is a little bit of my heart, we don't want to be seen as being needy. We want to, you know, we're independent. I can do it. And when Jesus steps in and begins to reveal the bigger thing, 
oftentimes it's really in a spot that's hard for us. It's a weakness. It's an area of sensitivity for us, a vulnerability. And he says, will you trust me with that? Will you admit <laughs> that you need that? Asking is risky because it reveals our heart. It reveals what we actually believe about Jesus. What he can do and what he can't do. Some of us just don't ask because our, our perspective of what God can do is just not that big. No, he won't do that. Or he doesn't care about us enough, right? Oh, he doesn't really care about me. God healed my car this week, by the way. Just so then, I, it's, it's a crazy story. Admit, uh, it, 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 asking is risky because it reveals our hearts. It, 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 again, it reveals our neediness, that we are dependent on him. It reveals if, whether we really trust him or not. And I think that's what it comes down to for some of us, right? We won't ever ask anything from God because we really don't trust him to answer. Do we really want his will to be done? I want my will to be done. <laughs> it's risky because it does create expectation. You know, they talk about in teaching, especially with little kids, you don't want to, you know, promise something that you can't deliver on, <laughs> right? You don't want to kind of create an expectation that then you eventually don't, you know, fulfill, right, in some sense, because it kind of, it's not good for the kids, right? And it creates a lot of tension, right? And so th that's, I think, part of it. Like, we're afraid to ask because that means we're going to expect that he's going to answer and we're afraid to expect. We also, asking is risky because we have to let go. We have to ask Jesus to intervene. We got to stop trying to fix the problem. The business world describes dreaming as, uh, or, uh, as uh, achievement, you know, excuse me. The business world just talks about dreaming, how important it is to dream and to have a vision. And then the next step is to plan, to strategize, to figure out how to do it. And then the final thing is for make it happen, right? Do the plan. That's achievement through our vision, through our strategy, through our effort. In the kingdom of God, though, Jesus invites us to dream, but then it changes. Then he says, now ask and receive. Jesus does the work. This was probably the biggest truth that helped me get to a point where I could finally really ask is when I realized that what I was asking for, not only could I not do it, I didn't have to do it. Like he was gonna do it. And so I gotta sit back and watch. <laughs> like I can ask for this big thing because it's about him. Now it's not that I don't have a place to ro a role to play in that and I'm looking and expectant that maybe he's gonna have me do something in this, but success is not on about me. All right, worship team, why don't you come on up? What are you dreaming about? Are you dreaming about earthly things or kingdom things? Are you making mud pies? <laughs> are you ready to eat some peach pie? Are you dreaming in color? Or are you still dreaming in black and white? Do you know what Jesus is dreaming? Have you ever asked him? Jesus, what are you dreaming about for me? Have you asked him what he's thinking, what he's hoping for? When was the last time you asked Jesus for anything? Not just the simple daily things, but the big audacious things. When was the last time you asked him for something big? When was the last time you asked him to do something impossible?
are you even daring enough to believe that he might actually do it? <laughs> I'll close with this passage, Matthew 20, verse 32. Sean, do you have that passage? There you go. Thank you. Two blind men are calling out as Jesus walks by. Hey, Jesus. Hey, hey, Jesus. Jesus finally stops. And he calls to them and he says, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus is asking you. He loves you. He has so much more. But we just need to hear him ask and answer. Yeah, maybe it's temporal things. Maybe it's just small things. That's okay. But what are the big things too? It's, it's asking for the big things that begins to stretch our faith. We begin to encounter him in a new way, understand his character and his goodness and his love for us. Church, let's dream. It's Christmas. We got maybe some extra time off, or maybe some time to do things a little bit differently in our schedule. Let's dream. Maybe you're going to be driving for like nine or ten hours to go see family. Dream while you're driving. Ask Jesus, what is the dream you have for me, Jesus? Help me to know and give me the courage to ask. Ask you for whatever it is. And then watch as you do your thing.
the coming of Jesus to the earth. It blew away all of our minds. It blew away all the dreams of what was to be expected of the Messiah. For the Messiah to come in the way that he came to, to come as a baby, no one saw it coming. It didn't seem possible. <laughs> it didn't make sense. But that's exactly what was your will. And it was your will from the beginning of time. You'd proclaimed it over and over again. There was hints throughout history and the prophets and the kings. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you have such a higher perspective than we do. Lord, help us to get a little glimpse of it. Lord, give us dreams, new dreams. In the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the world around us, it seems so divided. It's, it may seem crazy to dream, but Lord, you're calling us to dream. And Lord, not earthbound dreams that are just, you know, kind of simple things of this world, but things that include both this world and your world coming together. Things that have ramifications in the spiritual and the physical. Lord, give us your dreams. Help us to see, help us to hear. And Lord, give us the courage to ask. Ask boldly for things. To ask for your will to be done and for your kingdom to come. Lord, I pray that we would have a heart similar to the mother of Jesus. Luke chapter 1. <laughs> and the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be? I can't fathom, I can't dream this. This is what? Since I'm a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old days has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Lord, have your way in us. Give us your dreams. And may you make them come to fruition by your will and by your power for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church, for being with us this morning, and uh, Merry Christmas again to you. And again, we've got a couple more songs. So if you want to stay and kind of worship some more, please do. We encourage you to do so. If you'd like to go out and worship and fellowship, then encourage you to head out into the fellowship hall. Let the doors close behind you, and, and you guys can uh, have that uh, time of uh, fellowship out there. If you'd like prayer, we would love to pray for you as well. So please come forward. Uh, we'd love to join you in this time, whatever it looks like, whatever he's calling you into, or whatever you're dealing with. Uh, let's pray with you, join with you in that. All right, church. Merry Christmas and have a great day.